Hello everyone. Hello. Welcome. This beautiful day. It's going to be more and more difficult to go to any event as we uh, see this beautiful weather outside with the uh, uh, blossoms, trees blooming, uh, blue sky, gorgeous magnolias. What is this? Heaven? <laughs> and of course, partly. Uh, the uh, reason we have this beautiful weather today is uh, because our uh, guest, uh, <laughs> Dr. Asad Khan, is coming from Southern California and, uh, and uh, packed the, all the beautiful weather from Southern California and brought it here for us. And thank you for that. He's going to start raining as soon as I I know. <laughs> I was, by contrast, I was in LA a few weeks ago and it was snowing in LA. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Anyways, I'm uh, Beirut uh, Kamali Hafizi. I'm the director of uh, the Charmin and Bishami Salah Ahmadi Center for Iran and Christian Gulf Studies. Um, and it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Asan Gaud today uh, from uh, um, <coughs> the fans of calling. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Rod uh, works and research uh, work on uh, and writes on related issues of Iran policy and, and U.S.-Iran relations. Her writing can be seen in Newsweek, National Interest, the Independent, Foreign Policy, and uh, many other important uh, policy and uh, newspaper outlets. Uh, she has appeared as a commentator uh, in numerous uh, big media, um, in the BBC World, Al Jazeera, CNN, and the NPR. She has completed her dissertation uh, in uh, Middle East history from the University of California, Irvine, in 2018. Uh, today, she'll be talking about her recently released book, uh, the State of Resistance, Politics, Culture, and Identity in Modern Iran, which was published uh, by Cambridge University Press. Um, uh, in the book, Dr. Rod uh, argues, and I would leave the detailed conversation about the book to her, uh, but just as a um, little bit of a taste of the book that uh, she argues that why the Iranian nation state has long captivated the attention uh, of our media and politics. Iran remains a country that is often misunderstood with many aspects of its social, cultural, political existence unexplored. She shows how Iranian peoples have asserted themselves in shaping and defining the contours of their national identity. A well-researched book, Dr. Rod delves into the archives of popular culture in film, music, and literature to draw a comprehensive picture of, of life in Iran and its political uh, culture. Uh, let me uh, thank you again for joining us. And Well, first, thank you all for being here today and for giving me this opportunity to, to speak about a project that obviously took very many years um, and is dear to me for multiple reasons, not just the amount of labor that went into it, but as you may guess, I'm Iranian-American. So I was born and raised in the United States, but I'm of Iranian heritage. So exploring the subjects within this book um, was both a personal and academic experience. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today, and I'll, I'll hope to leave my comments to a minimum so we can have more questions and answers. I always think discussions are more interesting than just lecturing. Um, and I hope you think of this more as a story than as someone who's lecturing to you about anything. And there's really two stories within this project. Um, there's the personal story, right? How the project came to be, uh, why I decided to focus on this topic. And then there's the story inside of the book which is really the story of a people 
who have struggled against different forms of tyranny for a very long time, um, who have resisted in different ways the narratives that have been imposed on them by being the writers of their own stories. So it's very much about the agency of Iranians in Iran. Uh, and I say that because there's a distinction to be made between the diaspora, which I belong to, and Iranians in Iran. And that's actually part of the story, too. That's part of the personal narrative of, of where the, the book came from. So I'll start there. So I mentioned I was born and raised in the United States. Um, in, if you were in the US and you were of Iranian heritage in the 80s and 90s, especially in the 80s, um, you may have sensed some forms of alienation, right? Uh, Iran and Iranians were very often vilified in Western media, in popular culture. And that's something that I experienced growing up, despite the fact that I grew up in the more populous regions of the Iranian diaspora in California. First in Northern California, and then at a very young age in Southern California. Uh, you may have all heard of something called Tehranjalis, which is basically a square, there's Persian square in uh, Westwood in Los Angeles. So there's a very large Iranian diaspora but at the same time, there's the larger American culture that didn't always feel welcoming in terms of being assimilated to it. And I don't think that's unique necessarily to anybody who's of Iranian heritage. I think a lot of immigrants uh, to the US might sense that kind of alienation from the dominant culture. And that's why we tend to gravitate towards our uh, countries of heritage, right? To get a sense of belonging. Um, that's why I became interested in identity, identity politics, because of my own sort of uh, struggles to feel like I was, I belonged somewhere, essentially. I also came of age um, at a time politically in the United States when I was an undergraduate student. That's when, you know, 9-11 happened when I was an undergrad. So the war on terror, uh, the second intifada in Palestine, the war in Afghanistan, uh, the buildup to the war in Iraq. These were all of the events that sort of shaped my political outlook and just my view of the world. It also added to that sense of alienation, right? Because now you had uh, Muslims being alienated uh, in certain ways within that society. And if you were brown, it didn't matter if you were Muslim or not, right? Iranians, for instance, have a very diverse religious background, especially within the diaspora. And yet it didn't really matter what religious background you were part of. Uh, you know, when I remember uh, George W. Bush's State of the Union address in 2001, right after the attacks on 9-11 and the sort of infamous axis of evil speech that placed Iran on that axis of evil. So there was a refresher of that kind of vilification of Iran that you'd experienced if you grew up here in the 1980s. So I was very interested in, in understanding Iran, but what was interesting is that I actually thought I already knew. Look, I grew up in an Iranian household. I spoke Persian. I knew all the holidays. So when I traveled to Iran as an adult, I was shocked to find out that I actually didn't know as much as I thought, that I was very, very different than my cousins who had grown up there, and that I had really experienced a sort of bubble that my parents and that their generation had created here in the United States, right? They were sort of stuck in 1979 Iran. And it was fascinating to me to go to Iran and realize that it was almost a joke to my cousins that I was so square, essentially. I was square, I was simple. Um, they were ahead of me in everything, right? And I seemed like the, it seemed like I was the isolated one, right? I was the very sheltered one, even though I had grown up in the United States. And that's because my parents stayed in a time capsule that never really changed, whereas the country itself moved ahead as time moved forward. And so while I originally wanted to study Israel-Palestine, I wanted to study at AUB, I wanted to learn Arabic because I thought, as I studied Middle Eastern politics, I'm like, well, I already know about Iran. I don't need to learn anything about that. I realized the disconnect that I had to that population, to that people, and to that country, and really understanding its history. Um, when I began studying identities in school, I was sort of fascinated by this idea of constructed identities, right? That's something you've always learned. It's not something that, unless you study these things, you're exposed to necessarily. But the idea that the identities that we cling to so dearly are social constructs. Gender is a social construct. Race is a social construct. Nation states are just made up borders, right? This, to a young mind especially, seems um, 
really groundbreaking, but also scary to believe that these identities that we are tied to, does that mean they're fabricated? Does that mean they're not real? And so that's why I became very interested in studying nation states, the development of nation states, the development of national identities. Um, A, because nationalisms can be liberating or extremely dangerous, depending on how they're wielded, right? They're liberating when they're used as indigenous movements against colonial powers to create self-determination. They can be very dangerous when they become xenophobic, when they become chauvinist, and they become exclusive to one group over another within a nation state. So the fact that these communities, this idea of the nation state, um, especially in a world where internationalism has become such an important turn of phrase, right? We talk about international world orders. We talk about transcending borders. But the reality on the ground is that the nation state is not waning. The nation state is still the predominant way that we organize human societies. It's still the way that we communicate and cooperate with one another. So I really wanted to understand that, and I wanted to unpack it uh, in the Iranian case, specifically. I had used my Iranian identity to give myself a sense of belonging, but then realized that I didn't really belong there either. And so I became interested in understanding that identity a lot more. In my reading, I came across works by uh, Benedict Anderson and Eric Hobsbawm. Right? These are two historians that uh, really explored how the nation state developed over the last few couple of centuries, really. Um, most of the nation states that exist today have come into existence in the last 100 years. And yet, we're so tied to their histories. So then I realized the importance of the historical narrative. So we always hear things like, uh, history is written by the victors. But that narrative is so important in the way that people understand themselves and the relationship to the state, as well as how people understand people within those states. In my reading of Hobbsbaum, I came across an idea that it wasn't even his central thesis. It was just sort of a sentence that he had in passing in one of his books. But it was the idea that you could have nationalism, a sense of national identity, without a nation state. But the reverse was much less likely, to have a nation state with no national identity, with no national narrative. And I took that to mean that to be a modern nation state, you had to have a cohesive national narrative and identity that resonated amongst the masses. And so when I looked at that historical debate within the case of Iran and that debate within the revolution itself, the revolution of 1979, I tried to understand how that narrative played into both the revolution and uh, how we define the, the era of modernity in Iran. And there is debate within the academy about that. Um, for instance, the, the Pahlavi dynasty, which is the last dynasty to rule Iran under a monarchy, propagated a narrative that said their predecessors, the Qajars, were inept rulers. Um, that the Qajar dynasty marked a period of stagnation. Um, and of course, you know, new rulers don't want to talk, don't want to say anything good about previous rulers because you want to be the ones that sort of save uh, the country. And this is the narrative that the Pahlavis propagated. And that exists within the history of the academy as well, right? The idea that the modern nation state of Iran is established by the Pahlavi dynasty by creating these modern infrastructures, which they in fact did. Other historians will argue that reforms um, and modernizing projects actually began before they came into power under the Qajar dynasty. Uh, for instance, educational reforms that were very important. Um, sending students to Europe to study who brought with them back to Iran ideas like self-determination, uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment, like constitutionalism, which helped to contribute to the constitutional revolution in Iran in 1905. And those ideas became dominant within the era of the Qajar dynasty. There are others that will argue that uh, Iran's modernity starts with the Pahlavi dynasty in the 1920s. And of course, you do have to credit Reza Shah for the the modern infrastructures for creating all the sort of trappings of a modern nation state, right? Uh, conscription, an organized military, a formal secondary education, making Persian the official language under which everybody is educated. All of these are what modern nation state projects are because in order to be a modern state, people have to identify with that state. And so I also realized 
in reading the works of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, his son, who would become the last monarch of Iran, who was deposed in 1979. The narrative of the state and the nationalist project was actually integral to, to his larger modernizing project. And what I found um, was that while the Shah tried to create the sense of nationalism, in some ways he failed to do so. He failed to create one that resonated amongst the masses, and by so doing, created a space for a counter narrative, which is where revolutionaries came in, right? They came in by being able to criticize the narrative that the Pahlavi dynasty tried to propagate. And I found three sort of pillars of the national narrative of the Shah. Independence, revolution, and Persian dominion. These were the pillars of, these are the themes that are repeated over and over again when you read his writings. Now why independence and revolution? Especially revolution, right? Because usually monarchs don't try to act like they're revolutionaries because most revolutions are overthrowing monarchs. Well, in the 20th century, especially in the developing world, uh, especially in post-World War II era of self-determination, the establishment of nation states, sort of ending the era of colonialism and imperialism, you have indigenous movements in many places of the world that are trying to really fulfill the ideas of sovereignty that are being you know, rhetorically used uh, at the international level. So within that context where these independence and revolutionary movements are happening, the Shah taps into that language. And so one of the things that's very important that the Pahlavis uh, promote is the idea that as opposed to their predecessors, the Qajars, who were really you know, lost land to uh, the Russians, who gave concessions to the British and the Russians, who were part of the sort of great game uh, between Russian and British imperialism, they were able to save Iran from that, save them from the clutches of foreign powers. And this is the narrative that they talk about. So independence is very important, and the Pahlavis would be the, the leaders of fulfilling that independence. Now, there was a small problem with that presentation. The fact that Iran didn't feel independent to a lot of its own people. Um, Iran was never formally colonized, but it also wasn't independent of colonialism. It didn't exist in a vacuum. So for instance, it didn't have control over its most important natural resource, oil. Um, the story of oil nationalization, of course, is the story that leads to the 1953 coup. Uh, led by the United States and the United Kingdom against uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh, who is in really the leader of nationalization and reinstates the Shah in power in 1953. That event in and of itself is one of the, is one of the criticisms that is used against this notion of Iranian independence. In 1941, the Reza Shah is forced to abdicate his throne to his son and forced to leave the country because allied powers occupy Iran during World War II. These incidents sort of fly in the face of the narrative of independence. On top of that, in later years, because of the Shah's uh, very close relationship with the United States, this gives uh, thinkers within Iran the space to make criticisms that perceive the Shah as being tied to foreign powers. And so his narrative of independence is a little weak when you look at that evidence of that history. Then there's the narrative of revolution, right? Uh, the White Revolution that the Shah unveils in the 1960s is a very important reform movement. Uh, two of its key elements, one was land reform, right? Giving, taking land from the aristocracy and giving that land to, to ordinary Iranians. Um, in fact, you know, land reform was such a key part of, of the White Revolution that when you look at money, right, bills from, from that era, there's one in which there's a picture of the Shah handing out land deeds to the people, right? So this was a very important pillar of the White Revolution. Giving women the right to vote was another key element of the White Revolution. But talking about it in that language, using the language of revolution was important, which is why he wrote an entire book called The White Revolution, right? So these were important things to use because if if he could sell these ideas to the population, then the ideas of that revolutionary global movements that we were seeing wouldn't be as appealing necessarily because in fact, the dynasty would be doing this on their own. 
The third pillar uh, was Persian dominion, right? The symbols you use to create a national narrative. What symbols do you pull from? And what the Pahlavi dynasty did is go back to pre-Islamic Iran, to the Persian Empire. Uh, and he very much used those symbols to connect themselves. In fact, he did literally connect himself directly as if Iran was this 2,500 year unbroken monarchy, uh, which to a certain extent is ahistorical, right? There was a lot of, a lot happened in 2,500 years, but there were monarchies that came and went during that period as well. As the Shah's narrative fails, and there are other factors too, by the way, let me mention that. There's, there's no argument in the book that says the reason for the revolution is a failure of a national narrative. There's a whole canon of literature about the revolution and the causes and the reasons from social to economic to political, and all of those should be understood when you want to explain an event of that magnitude. But one of the areas that, that I thought, at least in my own research, that was not looked at as much was control over the story, right? The story is so important for people. The fact that the Shah wanted to emulate the West so much, that he was so interested in an audience outside of his own country, outside not only of his own country, but of his own region, right? He made comments that were disparaging towards his Arab and Turkic neighbors, for instance, um, and very much wanted to be seen as part of a more European tradition, because that was the tradition of success at the time. This led to criticisms, again, within the Iranian intelligentsia. The most, one of the most famous ex examples being um, Jalal Ola Ahmad's West toxification, right? The idea that uh, there was, this was a malady, this was an illness, that rather than looking to the indigenous roots of the country, the Shah was constantly looking for a way of mimicking the West. And that went against very much the indigenous movements that were happening globally at the time, right? It was a matter of taking pride back in your own religious and cultural roots, not just emulating the West. These are the types of disconnect that existed between his narrative and that of the actual populace. One of the more famous examples of his disconnect um, is a party he throws in 1971. So in 1971, um, the calendar has changed to the year 2500, and there's this grand party that's organized um, to celebrate 2500 years of Persian excellence. Except the problem was there wasn't anything really Persian about it. French cuisine was served, French champagne. Uh, European architects were brought in to create the tent city outside of Persepolis. Orson Welles was hired as the narrator for a documentary about the party, right? So it was very much still about a Western audience for Western dignitaries. And this is where a lot of Iranians at the time fa took issue with, right? We're celebrating Iran, but there are no Iranians involved in celebrating Iran. Um, not, only, you know, not only was there disconnect, obviously, because of these types of narratives, but there was the act very reality of political repression on the ground, the not allowing um, political freedom and openness for, for the society at large. So there were several grievances. But this is a lot of the ways in which the Shah's messaging failed. If you read his works or you listen to his interviews, um, he's very often quoting like obscure French philosophers, which a general Iranian audience would probably not be as familiar with, right? They don't have the same educational background. They're not reading the same things. And so you see that kind of divide that exists. And because of that gap, that's where the space exists for Iranians themselves to create a counter narrative from the bottom up. And part of that counter narrative um, is the use of, for instance, Islamic symbols, Shiite symbols especially, became really important as part of the, the revolutionary discourse. For one reason, because it lends itself to revolutionary fervor. If you know the quintessential story within Shiite lore is that of the martyrdom of Imam Hussein in the seventh century in the desert of Karbala, right? 72 people against thousands. That type of story is ubiquitous to other cultures as well. Uh, it's the classic David and Goliath story, or the Battle of, Battle of Thermopylae, the 300 Spartans against, in that case, thousands of Persian soldiers, right? So the theme of the underdog is not one that's unique to that culture or that civilization. In fact, it exists across cultures and civilizations because it's such a powerful story. It's such a powerful story to tell that even if the odds are against you, 
you're heroic. Some, you can be heroic somehow. You can still defend your ideology, your land, or whatever, you know, whatever it is that you're defending. And so they really tapped into that idea as well. Now, something interesting I came across in my, in my own research um, is a book by Hamid Daboshi called Shiism. And one of the things he posits in the book is that Imam Hussein is victorious in defeat. Right? He doesn't win, he loses. He's victorious because he's willing to sacrifice his life for principle, even if, even if he's not actually successful at overthrowing the power he wants to overthrow and establishing a power himself. So in a way, when Daboshi is talking about this concept and when you apply it to the Iranian state and what happens after the revolution of 1979, well, the Islamic Republic propagates a different narrative, obviously, than its predecessor. It co-ops, it appropriates the language of revolutionaries to promote an image of itself as a constant revolutionary, right? It is, it's a never-ending revolution because if it is to become the power, it becomes the tyrant, right? It's no longer Imam Hussein. The Islamic Republic is now the Yazid of the story. It's now on the opposite end of the story. So it has to constantly promote this idea of resistance culture, which it does, right? If any of you follow things about Iran, you may have heard of something called the axis of resistance. It's the axis of powers um, that are allied with the current Iranian state in the Middle East. The resistance economy, right? Iran is under sanctions by the United States and therefore its economy is even an economy of resistance. So this constant narrative that comes out of the Islamic Republic is one that was appropriated from revolutionaries themselves, that did resonate, that was a bottom-up process. But in so doing, much like their predecessors, they silence other narratives. So part of, uh, part of this sort of narrative building is the idea of silencing others, and both authoritarian states go through this process. But the common thread and the common theme within these two states is that from the bottom up, Iranians are always resisting themselves, right? Iranians are negotiating the contours of their own identity. They're accepting certain parts of the narrative, rejecting other parts of the narrative. They're taking from the symbols that are available to them. So when earlier I said identities are constructs, a nation state is a construct, your national identity is a construct, that doesn't mean it's fake. They couldn't take symbols from, say, Ireland because it wouldn't have made any sense. They had to take from the repertoire of symbols that existed for them. Iran's vast history, diverse religions, diverse culture allows them to pull from all sorts of different symbols. And depending on who is the power, who's in power, the symbols they use to resist who is in power, to resist the narratives of those who are in power also change. So whereas before the revolution, symbols, pre-Islamic symbols were used uh, I'm sorry, Islamic symbols, Shiite symbols were used before the revolution as a form of resistance. After the revolution, the pendulum swings in a different direction. You now have uh, many Iranians who celebrate pre-Islamic holidays, much more so than they used to, because these are everyday acts of resistance, right? We've seen that Iranian people have the agency not only to resist authoritarian powers, meaning when they're limiting them politically, socially, but also the narratives that these powers try to, try to wield. The narrow definition of what is Iranianness, whether it's the monarchy or whether it's the Islamic Republic, is being contested by the people themselves. And they do it sometimes through overt political acts. Right? You've seen, we've seen many iterations, protest is nothing new to Iran, although recently we've seen one of the larger waves of protest that we've seen in a very long time. But it doesn't have to be overt political acts that are forms of resistance. When the Islamic Republic propagates this idea of resistance culture, it also creates the space for Iranians themselves to appropriate that language, to use that language. So in 2009, when there are protests in Iran, uh, after a, the contested uh, election, the contested re-election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. They actually use the political slogans of the revolution against the state, the state that claims to be the revolutionary state, but they appropriate that language and use it against the state themselves. Um, the most recent, obviously, iteration of overt political resistance are the protests we saw that began in September uh, after the killing of Masajina Amini at the hands of Iran's so-called morality police. But there, what I also saw and why I looked at popular culture 
was because there are everyday acts of resistance, like the way that people dress, the culture they consume, the music they listen to, the films and television that they watch. What we see when you look at Iran's cultural consumption is a breakdown of that binary. It's not as simple as tradition versus modernity. Right? It's not like the country is broken down into people who are Muslim and people who are anti-Muslim. Right? And we saw that actually in these protests. We saw that nuance where, for instance, there were people who, were, um, who elect to wear the hijab, but also believe that it should be free for anybody who wants to. Right? So it wasn't a matter of rejecting the hijab itself. It was a matter of rejecting the lack of freedom. It was a protest in favor of freedom. And so what you actually see in the cultural consumption is more fusion and more pluralism. Right? They're not these neat categories or neat sort of compartments that you can put Iranian identity into, despite the way that they're used politically by the powers above. For Iranians themselves, they are much more nuanced. They are much more diverse. And they can play into these different identity compartments and simultaneously belong to all of them at the same time. So you see you have a country that is much more politically, culturally diverse than what we tend to see in the West when we're talking about Iran. And I say that in the introduction uh, that Behruz gave, you heard that I do work on policy. Why do I do work on policy? Ultimately, what drew me to this project was that I always believed, as someone who was an Iranian American, that there was a disconnect. There was misperceptions on both sides that Americans didn't really understand Iran or Iranians. And Iranians, because of the amount of propaganda that they're fed, don't necessarily understand that much about America or Americans. And that if we could bridge that gap, the sort of adversarial relationship or enmity that's existed for as long as it has could at least not be, you know, not necessarily make everybody friends, but could create more understanding, especially of those populations. And so for me, that's why this project was so important, to understand just how diverse it is. Because when you sit from the outside, like I said, I thought, I know everything about Iran. I, I'm an Iranian. My identity is Iranian. So everyone's got to be like me. And then I went there and realized, no, they are not. It's a, it's a much more diverse population than that, uh, than that that we understand. To a certain extent, my research and, and why I wanted to do this project was really for a Western audience. It was for an audience of people that didn't necessarily know this type of nuance or this type of story, because that's not the kind of imaging that we get when we talk about Iran. So I just wanted to read, before we go into the Q&A, I wanted to read one section of the book, if my voice permits. This is actually the concluding section of the book, but it gives you sort of a summation of what it's about. It is tempting in a contemporary world of connectivity, fast flow of information and people, and global relations to believe that the age of nation states is on the decline. But in reality, the nation state is still in its early stages in terms of human history and continues to be the dominant form of individual identity and international communications. For better or worse, a significant part of understanding the self and the other is still deeply tied to these imagined communities. More than an intellectual exercise or thought experiment, how a nation state defines itself and its relation to the global community carries real consequences. Even with the complex and often contrasting social and political spectrum that makes up Iranian identity, there are some discernible patterns and a limited set of motifs that Iranians choose from within their cultural and historical experience to define their Iranianness. At the center of that character is unwavering resistance defense of their homeland and its people, and the adoration of Vatan, or homeland. Perhaps the greatest individual figure in Iran over the last century to embody such qualities and unify Iranians is their famed vocalist, Mohammad Shajarian. Born in Mashhad in 1940, Shajarian first learned Quranic recitation and later trained in the classical singing of Persian poetry. Though his classical style may have appeared outdated as modern musical genres and pop music gained popularity, Shajarian grew to enormous fame as one of the most treasured artists of Iran. His passing at a hospital in Tehran in October 8th, 2020, at the age of 80, sparked an outpouring of grief in an already extraordinarily challenging year for Iranians. The torrent of emotions from Iranians all around the world was a testimony to his unmatched genius 
and his impact on Iranian society, politics, and culture. Turning the prose of famed Persian poets such as Rumi, Ferdowsi, and Hafez into song, Shah Jaryan's dulcet and powerful voice became a symbol of the nation. Not surprisingly, Iranians expressed their sorrow in a similar national language of collective mourning. Undeterred by the risks of the COVID-19 pandemic, Iranians gathered outside the hospital to sing the songs of their beloved vocalist in somber unison. Both before and after the revolution of 1979, his songs often called for justice, engendered pride, and a longing for better days ahead. In times of turmoil and despair, his songs were the soundtrack of Iranian resistance and a reminder to be hopeful for the coming of the dawn. Despite the many challenges that Iranians have faced, they continue to fight back as agents of change, use the tools at their disposal, and forge their own identity with all its variations. Although the goal of this project is to contribute to the academic discourse on contemporary Iran and to provide a broad overview for policymakers and the general public alike, Ultimately, I wanted to tell a story. No story is ever whole or complete, but I wanted to tell a story that many Americans may have heard in passing, but know little about. The story of a people who have struggled for their independence and freedom, which has been dashed by foreign and domestic forces for well over a century. The story of a people as diverse as their rich history and culture would suggest. Thank you for listening. interesting after the revolution was that oh, the generation that came after the revolution really actually tried to engage in the political system up until a certain point, and we can get to when that point, when that shift happens. But for decades, they participated in, say, uh, elections, even though, I mean, Iran's political system is clearly not democratic. There is a democratic apparatus within it, right? So you have you have in the constitution that's uh, drafted in December of 1979 and adopted, you have the structure of a democracy, but then it's overlaid by an authoritarian state, right? With the idea of vela atifari. And so within that, there is attempts made to engage within the system and participate in elections. And Iranians actually, until 2021, so until very recently, um, overwhelmingly participated in elections, typically. Not always, but for the most part, they participated in them. So that was one way of trying to actually make changes within the system, is believing that the system had the capacity uh, for that kind of change. I mean, in terms of like factions, it's, it has a, there's a large political spectrum, really, right? A lot of times you hear uh, Western media sort of go, you know, hardliners, reformists, as if that's the only two things that can exist. And of course, that's not the case. There's a spectrum in which people exist. You have conservatives, moderates, reformists, hardliners, if that's what you want to call them. So they go across this political spectrum. And there's a lot of competition within the state uh, vying for power, which is, by the way, something that happens initially after the revolution, right? The, the Islamic Republic takes, doesn't exist from February 1979 in this fashion. It starts to take shape as these factions fight each other, and really one party uh, consolidates power around itself. So there are attempts by Iranian people to engage that system, believing that it might, be, it might have the capacity for change. What has happened? more recently that's shifted that dynamic. Uh, 
is in 2021, you have another election. There's, I think, something like 42 or 43 percent voter turnout, um, which is historic low since the revolution of 1979. And there's various reasons for it. Um, one is, by 2021, Iranians find themselves in a very, very difficult situation, both domestically and from, uh, and from the pressures that are coming from abroad, right? Um, when the US withdraws from the nuclear agreement in 2018, reimposes sanctions, it creates a lot more uh, economic, like spiraling economic downturn in the country. You have the COVID-19 pandemic that affects everybody, hits Iran very hard, and of course you have ridiculous things like the Supreme Leader uh, outlawing UK, like British and American vaccines. Um, you also have in the 2021 election, so there's always a lot of vetting, right? It's not really a democratic system. So who is allowed to run is always vetted. But in 2021, you see extreme vetting. So even pillars of that very system are not allowed to run. So, it's, so since we talked about these different factions, essentially one faction completely decides to take over, and that's like the further right-wing hardline faction. Um, and that's one of the reasons that people aren't voting. They're not voting because they're just, this, disaffected with the system. Um, they're not voting because it was essentially an entirely rigged, rather than being a quasi-rigged election, it was an entirely rigged election to allow someone like Ebrahim Raisi to become the president. As a counterpoint, so Ebrahim Raisi becomes president in 2021 because he's essentially handed the candidacy. Why? In 2017, he also ran. Ebrahim Raisi ran against uh, Hassan Rouhani in 2017 when you had 70% voter turnout in Iran in 2017, and Rouhani swiftly defeated him. So you see this extreme vetting because in order for someone like Raisi to win, basically you have to eliminate any other competition existing. So, and then in these protests that we saw, that we've seen in the last several months, you see another shift because there's a new, and I wish I could add a chapter to the book, maybe in an updated version, there's a new generation that comes to the scene. So where it was the post-revolutionary generation tried to engage with the system, Gen Zers, these younger Iranians who were born you know, in, uh, in the 2000s, um, they have a very different relationship to the state and they have a very different relationship to historical events. So they're much more removed from things like the revolution of 1979 or the war in the 1980s between Iran and Iraq, which also really helped shape Iran of today was that war. Um, it helped shape the Islamic Republic, right? Those narratives of resistance that I say that they promote, that's, that was the stage, that was the best stage for them to develop that narrative because Iran was in fact attacked um, by Iraq at the time. And so they could create this idea of resistance narratives that were imbued with nationalist rhetoric too. That's something to keep in mind. Um, they use religious overtones a lot, but it's also highly nationalist. In its, in its tone. Um, so when you have this newer generation that comes to the scene in 2022, essentially, they reject the idea that the system can be reformed at all. And so that's why you see, and this is not the first time we've seen calls uh, for like death to the dictator or the overthrow of the system itself. Back in 2009, you saw that happen too. But 2009 was really the first time you saw that happen. That taboo was broken in those protests that went from where is my vote to death to Khamenei. Right now, it just immediately goes to death to Khamenei and uh, talking about overthrowing the system itself. Because while the previous generation tried to reform within the state, it's seen as, it's understood by the younger generation as a state that's not, and I'm not saying this is myself personally or an opinion, this is how, this is how I'm reading the, the way that people on the ground are reading the situation. Um, so that's sort of the, the situation that they find themselves in today. There's still generational divides on these things, and there's still a lot more nuance in the way that they understand it. So for instance, you can have people that are vehemently against the Islamic Republic, like really, really against it, who are still simultaneously fearful of what will happen to Iran if, say, um, a civil war were to break out or if you know, foreign powers were to get involved, um, or who don't participate in protests because they don't necessarily, not that they don't agree with the protest, but they don't know what direction it's going in, right? So there's, there are people who may have participated in elections in the past who decide to boycott them now. There are people who boycott them now who may decide to participate again in the future. And the reason I say that is because that is actually how the cases have worked out. If you look at individual people, and there's some, in the book, I actually have field research as well. So when you look at these individuals 
even as an individual, they change over time, let alone the society at large. So you might have a case of an individual who was ardently reformist, participated in elections, encouraged other people to participate in elections, and are now like, nope, this is not going to be reformed. We shouldn't be participating in elections. And that person may again change later. So it's very much um, a question of the context, the socio-political context of what's going on at the time that sort of defines it. But that's the interesting part to me, is that it's dynamic. It's never fixed. Not even the individual has a fixed opinion, let alone the state itself, which is very often, like I said, hardliner reformist. It's a much more complicated than that, though. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> can I say no? Of course yeah. not. <laughs> you can say no. Uh, I think one of the interesting chapters uh, that really uh, drew me in to the book is your engagement uh, with the Shah's writing. Mm. And, uh, and those three elements on revolution, independence, and dominion, uh, which is uh, all quite fascinating in terms of the narrative of uh, the nation. And uh, I wonder if we can also add religion to that. Because I, you know, in, in the past few years, I've been reading the sort of same kind of documents uh, and, uh, and it was quite interestingly surprising to me how much religion exists in, or Shiism exists in Shah's narrative about the nation. And uh, I'm just curious to see if you can sort of uh, comment uh, a bit on that, that uh, uh, we always, when I say we, I'm talking about myself, this is royal, maybe. No. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, there was assumption that, that Shaw's reference to religion is very cynical. Uh, but as I read this, I really don't see that much of cynicism as part of possibly an extension of those three elements of his national nation building that he's also trying to appropriate, again, unsuccessfully. Mm -hmm. right? uh, because then there is a very, very strong competing uh, Shi'i narrative out there that's undermining him. Uh, but I wonder why don't you include that? Because in, in your three elements of, of this uh, nation building narrative. Actually, I think that's a really good point. Because that's true. When you, when you read his writing, He's anti-Shia. In fact, he's the opposite, right? He identifies very much as um, uh, the spiritual leader of the country as well. Um, of course, he lacks the spiritual credentials to be the spiritual leader of the country. But he, you know, there's a famous picture of the Shah um, on pilgrimage at Mecca. Uh, this is when Saudi and Iran had better relations because they were both monarchies and liked each other more then. Um, there's also uh, there's a lot of spaces where he's talking about. You know, he has dreams where Imam Ali like, shows up in his dreams. Um, so there's, he's definitely not rejecting, so especially if you compare it to his father, right? A lot of people reference, um, especially over the hijab debates that have occurred in recent months, they'll reference the fact that, oh, the Shah outlawed uh, the Chador, right? This like traditional Islamic garb. Well, the Shah didn't, his father did. So in fact, under the last Shah, they were allowed to wear it. So he didn't have the same kind of, um, the more sort of anti-religious stance that his father did. Um, the reason I didn't put it in part of the three pillars is because I didn't see it as a pillar that he was promoting as part of the national narrative. When he writes the history of Iran, I mean, he has, his last book is literally called Answer to History. So that tells you what he thinks about historical narratives, right? How important the narrative is, is that he's the writer of this history. Something else about that book that I thought was interesting is the author's note. So remember I said he really cared about Western audiences? Uh, the author's note in Answer to History, this is the last book he writes. This is the book he writes after the revolution, when he's dying. Uh, the author's note says that the American version is meant to be the definitive version of the text. So that means even in his last breaths, his audience was still not Iranian people necessarily. But I didn't see it as a dominant part of the national narrative that he was talking about. So when he writes this history, he's much more focused on empire, right? The Persian Empire and monarchy, because 
he's selling monarchy as the preeminent um, way to operate a state. I mean, when he's asked, well, what do you think unifies the country? He says the monarch. He says literally himself, like as the father of the nation. So in that sense, I, I don't think that he, I certainly don't think that he rejects, rejects Shaism. I agree with you. There's no real cynicism there. Um, and I do think that he saw himself in certain ways as the spiritual leader of the country. Um, but I didn't see it as integral to his story of Iran's history, if that makes sense. Iranian citizenship uh, is uh, through blood, as they say. Like you, you have to have a Persian mother, a Persian father to become uh, Iranian, so to speak. Uh, whereas in the United States, if a baby is born within uh, American airspace, uh, you're automatically a citizen of this country. Um, uh, but uh, I still kind of subscribe to that school of thought until very recently. Uh, uh, Men coach, uh, a soccer coach, who was from Spain. Uh, he's been in Iran for uh, over a couple of decades now. Um, and he speaks Farsi fluently. I mean, <laughs> as good as me, if not better. Uh, and, uh, How good is your Farsi? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're never going to find out. Um, you're not here. Uh, uh, no, I'm kind of well versed in uh, recite poetry and so forth. But uh, he's really good, and, and he communicates real well. Uh, and he considers himself uh, Iranian. He, he considers Iran the second uh, uh, nation, and he considers himself Iranian. He, he, he kind of, uh, all his friends are Iranian. I think he's married to Iran, an Iranian uh, also. Uh, he, he's, by the way, in his like, 60s and stuff. So, um, so uh, yeah, uh, my question is very simply, what constitutes an Iran in your opinion? Well, <laughs> well, I would first say that it's not for me to say, right? What constitutes an Iranian is certainly not for me to say, and I would not endeavor to define that. I think what's important about the general question, and this can be applied to an American, right? Because that's something I've always grappled with myself. What is an American? Um, within the history of the United States, that has been a constant question because it's an immigrant country. Who is considered an American? In very many ways, I feel like I've never been considered a real American. And why do I say that? Um, if I, when I make, when I talk about politics related to Iran, I'm speaking as an expert on Iran, but I'm never listened to like an expert in Iran. I'm told I should go back to my country, which is apparently Iran, even though I was born in San Francisco. So, you know, there's this type of the belongingness of what defines um, you belonging to a nation state is often defined by the political moment that you exist in. What I'll say, by the way, about the, um, the citizenship law in Iran is there's actually been, I think it was in 2021, um, the parliament actually passed something to amend the how citizenship is given because it's given, it's traditionally only been given through the father to the blood relation that you're referring to. But they're extending it to the mother as well for obvious reasons, because some people don't have an Iranian father, but they have an Iranian mother. And especially in Iran, you imagine how many, I mean, Iran has a huge Afghan population because of Afghan refugees that have come over, right? When Afghan men marry Iranian women, their kids aren't citizens of Iran, even though they're born and raised in Iran, their mother is Iranian. So there's some uh, legal change that has at least happened inside of the country that's defined it, at least not exclusively through the father, but it is still a blood definition. Um, and I'll say a lot of, uh, there's a lot of states in the Persian Gulf where citizenship, I mean, the, the fact that in the US, if you're born here, you're a citizen, that is not standard practice. Um, in the case of a lot of Persian Gulf states, because they're welfare states that provide so much for their citizens, it's extremely difficult to become a citizen. This is like generations can live there and they won't grant them citizenship. So, you know, it, I would not venture to, to define what is an Iranian, but I think that it's really up to the individual. If they, I think it's less about legally what you're attached to and more about what you identify as, personally. The 
Glad you brought up the nuclear question. Um, when I was talking about the earlier question you asked about, because um, you mentioned, and now I remember that you mentioned it, do they gravitate towards the West or do Iranian people, like how do they sort of define these relationships? Well, when Iranians, I said 70% showed up to vote in 2017 to re-elect Hassan Rouhani. Now, why? What did Rouhani do in his first term? The nuclear deal. That was his big success. Why he was elected overwhelmingly in 2013 originally was also the same idea. So that would tell you if the population is coming out and voting, they're voting for a specific policy. That means they want to engage with the West, right? They tried doing that essentially. And it's not the first time that that's happened since the, since the revolution of 1979. I think it's, um, it's clear that most Iranians, and I'm basing that on the data when you look at elections, right? When you look at a bunch of different data that exists, want to engage not only with the West, but with the entire world. They don't want to be isolated. They want to be integrated into the global system um, for the most basic reason, because it benefits them, right? They cannot, Iran is sort of this untapped technocrat society. I mean, it's a country of over 80 million people. They're highly educated, and yet they're disconnected from the global economy. They're disconnected from the world. And so the nuclear issue, if you look at the Iranian population, they very clearly wanted detente with the United States, wanted to maintain a civilian nuclear program, but under the agreement would not have a weapon program, right? So that's where, they, that's where the population stood. Now, the agreement was originally very popular very popular. Uh, this is according to polls. This is, you know, anecdotally, I was actually in Iran. The last time I was in Iran, when I was finishing my field research, was right after the deal in 2015. So September of 2015. And there was, this is anecdotal, of course. This is someone who's doing field research. I didn't take data, but there is data to back it up. There was a palpable sense of hope in the country that something was changing, because it did, right? The fact that the Islamic Republic sat down with the United States, negotiated a deal, had their flags in the background and shook hands was a very big deal because it flew in the face of this sort of anti-American rhetoric that the Islamic Republic had propagated for so long. Um, so it was a big deal when that happened and that's I think what Iranians, the majority supported. Since 2015, when you look at polls, there's a very clear decline in popularity for obvious reasons because what they were supposed to get out of the deal never really bore fruit. Um, partially because there was an election in the United States the following year, um, who became President Trump, candidate Trump, was very much against the nuclear deal. He withdrew from the deal and reimposed sanctions on Iran, um, which were far worse than the ones that existed before. And so it lost popularity because it basically didn't give anything uh, to the populace, what they were expecting to get out of it. So there's also a little bit of a shift in the calculus. There, I've seen people who, for instance, were very much supportive of the deal, who are now entirely against it and actually think Iran should weaponize because there was no incentive into entering the deal, right? They were almost punished for entering into the deal. So it's interesting when you think about what's happening on the Iranian side, that Iranian psyche is also being influenced by decisions that are made in Washington, right? Had the US stayed in the deal, where would we be right now? It's you know, obviously hard to say, but I still think based on the polling that we've seen, there's a barely majority that still support the deal. That's the last polling that I've seen, but barely a majority, right? Maybe like 50 point something percent that still support um, the deal, and that's essentially because they want sanctions relief. But there is a larger, there's a growing belief also that having a weapon would be an actual deterrent because not having a weapon so far has not been. Does that answer your question on that? If you want to know more about that, and we had to finish her presentation, she's defending it in a month, and after the defense, hopefully it will become public so you can read a lot of that. It's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. In English, right? Huh? In English? Uh, no, in, in Finnish. <laughs> no, in English, yes. No, in English. Yeah. Uh, we are out of time, uh, so uh, sorry that you don't get a chance to hear your questions. But thank you again. Thank you. Time.